Hello, AP History students, and welcome to another session of AP Euroblast. As always, I'm here to spark your interest in European history, to activate your memory, and to draw connections. But today is not about getting ready for the exam. Today is about black lives in European history, and specifically about 16th to 18th century Portugal and Spain. It's going to be the first in the series. Black people have made up a very small percentage of Europeans over time, but they were there, and they are there now, and they have played a role. My students have been asking me about blacks in European history for many years now, and I've never felt really satisfied with how I've answered the topic. Recent events have forced me to think about this again, because the brutal deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor have devastated our communities and they've shaken countries around the world. They've epitomized previous acts of violence against blacks in the United States, and they've also made a much larger audience aware of the reality and the effects of institutionalized racism, as well as our blindness to them. But history can be a powerful weapon against these forces. How we study people in the past impacts how we see and how we treat people in the present and in the future. We dignify the people of the present and the past simply by giving them our attention and by trying to understand them as individuals within their own context. Today we'll discuss the lives of black trumpeters who played for kings, a successful black painter, a black nobleman, and even a black ambassador. At the very least, I wish to make black lives more visible than they usually are in the AP curriculum. Whenever possible, I want to show black people as protagonists in their own lives and shapers of European history. And I'll try to challenge some of our big assumptions about what European history really is. I don't presume to give you all the answers, but I do hope to help start new conversations. As an historian and educator, this is what I can give as support and as a vocal ally to those leading the movement for racial justice. Let's start with this curious painting, The King's Fountain, which shows the bustling city of Lisbon in early 16th century. Here we see a mixed crowd that includes black people in a variety of roles, even as nobles. We'll discuss them later in detail, but what's important to note for now is how the painting immediately deflates two common assumptions about European history. One, that it's only about white people, and two, that the only position for blacks was as slaves. We know from other sources that in cities like Lisbon and Portugal and Seville and Spain, that blacks may have represented between 7.5 to 15% of the total population throughout the 16th and 18th centuries. Lisbon and Seville were already important port cities with old trade ties to Africa and the Middle East. New ties to Asia and the Americas now added to their dynamism and to the growth. In the early days of discovery and conquest, those cities were also the major transit points for the majority of blacks, free as well as slave, that traveled to the New World. Only later did the transatlantic slave trade bring most blacks directly from Africa to the Americas. So what was life like for blacks in early modern Iberia? The answer is complex. We'll get to those stories, I promised, in a moment, but as always, we need some context first. Well, the majority of blacks in 16th century Iberian cities were slaves. Surprised? Didn't think so. Here's where most of them were bought and sold, at the Mercado de Escravos in Lagos, Portugal. Estimates are that Iberia imported somewhere between 200 and 400,000 black slaves between 1440 and 1700. Legally, they're the property of other people just like slaves of all other races. But there, most of the similarities to slavery later in North America end. Perhaps the most two important differences were that, one, in European minds, slavery was not yet primarily associated with race. And two, the Iberian Peninsula, as the rest of Europe, slavery was not associated with work on plantations either. Okay, so let's unpack those two statements. First, the easier one on plantations. This map here shows the Madeira Islands and the Canary Islands. Portugal and Spain did start to experiment with plantations here in the 15th century, but nowhere in continental Europe were there any plantations. And this meant that nowhere were there large numbers of slaves all doing the same task. Slave roles were diverse, and slavery itself was fluid. People could move between different roles, and even out of slavery itself. Second, slavery and race. Black slavery in Iberia had definitely started to grow in the 1440s. But slavery didn't define Iberia's relationship with Africa. Their relationship was much older, so Europeans didn't yet view blacks as slaves more than they did any other races. It was religion that historically had been the reason for slavery. And this was true for non-Europeans as well as Europeans. In Iberia, this involved nearly 800 years of conflict between Muslims and Christians, what we call the conquest and the reconquest of Spain and Portugal. In seven short years, Arab Berber Muslims conquered almost all of the Iberian Peninsula, everything except Asturias, and they governed large portions of Iberia for the next 780 years. That was how long it took Christian kings to reconquer Portugal and Spain, culminating in the conquest of Granada in 1492. Arab Berbers enslaved Christians as they conquered Spain, and they traded them to other Muslim regions. At the same time, they brought in Christian slaves to Spain from Eastern Europe, thousands of them. 
As Christians reconquered Iberia, they took Muslim slaves, and it didn't make any difference to them whether they were white or non-white. They were Muslims. Some of the Arab Berbers were dark-skinned, but many were not, as you can see in these photos of modern-day Berber people. In any case, they certainly were not the same as the Sub-Saharans that later made up the race-based slave population. There's a lot more to be said on this, so check out the bibliography and the suggestions for further reading I've left in the description box. The main point is that both within and beyond slavery, there was plenty of room for social mobility in early modern Iberia. Now onto the stories that illustrate that point, starting with our royal black trumpeters. Working with documents like this can be really frustrating at times. There's so much more that we don't know than what we do. We don't even know if the trumpeters in this painting were free or if they're slave. Here's what we do know, and a couple conclusions. The trumpeters were part of a mural that the Queen of Portugal had painted for a convent in Lisbon. Second, there are many written records of black trumpeters all across European courts. So presumably, this is an accurate representation of Portuguese court life. And third, the artist knew what black people looked like, and he could paint them fairly well, probably because he had seen many around Lisbon. This artist, in contrast, didn't seem to have that familiarity. He clearly didn't know how to paint black faces as well. Or hands. And maybe the white faces aren't that great either. Okay, but my point is about not knowing black faces, and it isn't a surprise because this painting was made in England. But because blacks in England were so rare, we actually do know the identity of this person and a little bit about him. This guy was known as John Blank. John, or Juan in Spanish, João in Portuguese, or Jean in French, was one of the most common names of the day. So we're going to hear and see it again and again as we learn about other blacks in European history. Historians speculate about this particular Juan that he was given the name Blanc either as a misspelling of black or as a humoristic reference to the French word for white, blanc. French, after all, was widely spoken at the English court. In any case, John Blank was a paid trumpeter at the courts of Henry VII and Henry VIII, and we even have record of him demanding a raise from the king. Like most blacks in 16th century Europe, Blank passed through Iberia first. He accompanied Catherine of Aragon when she traveled to England to marry the new English king. Man, that was underwhelming. Okay, I know what you're thinking. I'm thinking it too. Documents, please give us something more. This is supposed to be interesting. Documents, got more? Nope. Sorry guys, I guess that's all we got. That just means that we're going to have to think harder about what we do have. But what can we conclude? Well, if black trumpeters played in courts across Europe, and John Blank felt that he could demand a raise from Henry VIII, we could say that several black people did develop skills that were prized by rulers, and they were able to leverage those skills to improve their status. And that's not a small thing. To see a great example of this, let's turn now to this extraordinary portrait of Juan de Pareja. Note, Another one. The New York Metropolitan Museum of Art paid $2 million for this portrait in 1971, the first time that that amount was ever paid for a painting. Pareja's life illustrates three types of black social mobility in the early modern Iberian world. First, his role of work. As assistant to Diego Velazquez, one of Europe's all-time greatest painters, he had higher status and comfort than other slaves. He's well-fed, well-clothed, and as we'll see, he led an intellectually stimulating life. Second, racial mixing. He's the son of a white father and a black mother, which may have led to opportunities denied to his mother. Third, freedom. Although he's born a slave in Spain, and he spent most of his life as one, he was able to win his freedom through his own talent, and he was even able to achieve recognition and success as a painter. The fact that we have such a stunning and sensitive image of Pareja probably reflects Pareja's importance to Velazquez. By extension, it may reflect Pareja's own qualities as an individual, but this raises more questions than answers, and I leave them to the art historians. So what do we know? At the time of the painting, Velázquez and Pareja had worked together at least eight years, and possibly many more. And it was painted in Rome. The King of Spain had sent them there to buy artwork to decorate one of his palaces. So these two probably knew each other pretty well. On top of the years they had already spent together, they were far from home, in a foreign land, with a different language. They probably interacted even more closely than they would have at home closer to their usual social circles. And we know that Velazquez made the portrait in order to practice for a commissioned portrait of the Pope. And we can see in these two paintings, yes, the colors are really different, but look at the positions of the heads and the shoulders. This was surely deliberate on Velazquez's part. Now, let's think about the situation a little more. Velazquez had the pressure of a really important job coming up. 
He must have spent countless hours thinking about how to paint the Pope while he was working on the Pareja portrait. He needed to because the Pope was a busy man and he wouldn't have had that much time. Velazquez, of course, owned Pareja's time, and he seems to have used it. He observed his assistant intensely. The sensitivity to light and expression clearly show it. And this time and focus may have opened Velazquez to seeing Pareja in different ways than he had before. In the same year, Velazquez finally granted Pareja his freedom. Coincidence? Perhaps. But perhaps not. Okay, enough about Velazquez. Let's focus on Pareja. According to legend, Pareja learned to paint in secret because Velazquez had deliberately kept him from learning. Nonetheless, it's hard to imagine a better training for an aspiring painter. Even in secret, he learned from the very best. Think of everything he must have seen in Rome and in other places, in addition to his daily observations of Velazquez. This brings us to a wonderful story that shows Pareja's astuteness, his determination, and his ambition. Knowing that King Philip IV regularly visited Velazquez's studio to inspect the latest works, Pareja carefully hid one of his own paintings among the masters. When Philip IV turned around Pareja's painting, Pareja threw himself at the king's feet, and he begged that he intervene with Velazquez so that he could paint freely. The monarch was so impressed that not only did he agree, but he told Velazquez to free Pareja, saying someone with such talent cannot be a slave. And Pareja did become a respected painter in his own right during his own lifetime. So, we're going to take a look at two of his paintings. This portrait is so striking in its realism, in its expression, and its use of light, that it's easy to take it for one of Velazquez's own. And many observers did at the time and long afterwards. We know it isn't, because it was painted at earliest during the year that Velazquez died. Pareja has even stood the test of time. Ten of his paintings are still with us, and they're important enough to be in the collections of some of the world's top museums. For example, this painting in Spain's Prado Museum, The Calling of St. Matthew, one of Pareja's most celebrated works. Pareja has included himself as an onlooker, and for good measure, he's holding a paper sign with his name. He wants us to know who he is. Curiously, he's the only figure staring out at the viewer, and he's only one of two people not looking at Christ. And there's something else peculiar about his gaze and posture. They recall Velazquez's own self-portrait five years earlier, also as part of another painting, Las Meninas. Let's leave further commentary to art historians and to class discussion. But at the very least, this painting opens up all sorts of possibilities of analyzing who Juan de Pereja was and how he thought. Back now to the King's Fountain. Among the many blacks we see, boatmen, porters, and guards, and we can even see at least four black noblemen. How do we know that they're noblemen? The most obvious is this guy that we think to be Juan de Sa Panasco. Not only is he riding a horse, but he's wearing the Red Cross of Santiago on his cloak. Only members of the military order of Knights of Santiago could wear this emblem, and what could only become a member by appointment from the king. Now, some of you are thinking, wait, haven't we already seen this emblem? Yep, we sure have, but it was easy to miss because we were paying more attention to Pareja. We do know something about Juan de Sao. Hopefully future historians are going to tell us a lot more because he had a remarkable life. Sa became a court jester for the King of Portugal, and this meant that he had a regular audience with the most powerful person in the country. Since his job was to amuse the king, Sa had to be mentally quick and a strong observer of other people. We know that he got his biggest laughs by making fun of the nobility at court. And these were the people who thought that they should be getting the king's favor rather than mockery. So Sa simultaneously gained enemies as he grew his influence with the king. But he earned the cross of Santiago for something else. For this. He accompanied the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V in the conquest of Tunis in North Africa. And this was a huge victory for Christendom against the expanding Ottoman Empire. Christians from Vienna to Madrid rightly perceived the Ottoman Empire as a threat, and taking away an important Mediterranean port relieved pressure on the Iberian Peninsula. Now, those other nobles. Only nobles were allowed to wear swords, and we see two black men with swords at their sides in front of Sa, and one behind him with an unsheathed sword. Nobility was in common, in general, and especially for blacks, but it definitely was not unheard of. Finally, cities like Lisbon and Seville might also receive African ambassadors, such as Don Miguel de Castro. Finally, somebody who's not Juan. Don Miguel came from the Catholic Kingdom of Congo, and Congo had been developing important diplomatic and cultural ties with Portugal for the past 150 years before this portrait was made. The Portuguese government commissioned this portrait, so they obviously thought that Don Miguel was pretty important. Clearly, there were many roles in which blacks could see themselves and be seen by others in the early modern Iberian world. And we need to see them that way too, as active shapers of European history. 
In the next session, we'll look at black individuals in another role, as one of the fastest paths to riches and glory in the new world for Spaniards of all colors, that of the conquistador. I hope you've enjoyed this new addition to AP Euroblast. Please check the bibliography and suggestions for further reading that I've left in the description box, and stay tuned for more sessions on black lives in European history. As always, please leave me your comments, including your suggestions for future episodes. Remember to like, share, and subscribe, and keep learning! Thanks for watching. It's been a blast. Yeah.